everybody. We're really excited that you're here. Um, and let me just quickly, before we forget, um, mention that the, the PowerPoint can be downloaded on the screen. Is that right, Tiara? Yes, if you look right below the public chat box, you'll see a files box and you can download the PowerPoint. Just click on that document and hit download file. Great, okay, thank you. So um, we will be um, posting the recorded uh, webinar online, so you'll be able to share it with all of your colleagues and friends. Um, my name is Tamara Sale. I am the director of the ESA Center for Excellence at the Oregon Health and Science University School of Public Health in Oregon, obviously, um, and I've been doing this work for um, many years um, and have really discovered that uh, peer support is, is one of the most important elements of the services that we provide. Um, but we kind of came at that the hard way, and uh, the good news is that we have some amazing experts who are willing to share with us today, uh, Sasha and Jonathan. Sasha, could you introduce yourself real quick? <clears throat> hey y'all. Hi. Um, so yeah, my name is Sasha De Bruel, and I'm I'm talking to you here in uh, New York City at the OnTrack Central Office in Washington Heights, and um, I'm I'm super excited to get to present to you all. Um, I mean, like really the thing to say about me that's important is that I, uh, you know, I'm someone who who was diagnosed with a psychotic disorder when I was a teenager, and I spent a bunch of time in and out of psychiatric hospitals, and then um, my friends and I started a a network of peer-based mental health support groups called the Icarus Project, and then I ended up working in the mental health system. And um, so here I am, and I'll be presenting to you all. Great, thanks. And I, I hope you'll also share the, the manual that you developed. Um, Sasha's done some, some really great work in this area. Uh, Jonathan, do you want to introduce yes. yourself real quick? Yes, hi, everybody. I'm Jonathan Dome, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts Transition to Adulthood Research Center. And I'm also right now an employment specialist at a first episode program in Boston. Like Sasha, I have a long history as a um, client, as a young adult and thereafter, and also trying to look for jobs. And it's led me to really be involved in this consumer movement now and implementing the peer role. Great, thank you. And um, once again, Jonathan has uh, written a, an amazing compendium of all the things that you need to know about supporting uh, peer support workers. So um, it, you guys will definitely want to read those afterwards. Um, this webinar um, is hosted by um, the EASY Center for Excellence as part of the National Technical Assistance Network for Children's Behavioral Health and it's um, sponsored or funded by SAMHSA. Uh, so we're very appreciative of, of that network. Um, and as people develop ideas of other webinars they'd like to see or uh, technical assistance materials, maybe building on what you hear in the webinar today, feel free to type them into the chat and uh, we will think about those as we uh, plan our next series of webinars. Um, also, I just want to mention quickly that the first early psychosis association, uh, first early psychosis meeting in the United States um, is going to be held um, in October, on October 7th, at the International Early Psychosis Association Conference in Boston. So um, the three of us will all be there, and we hope to meet you guys in person. Um, and also, if you have not yet joined, um, you should join PAPNET, the um, psychosis Prodromal and Early Psychosis Prevention Network, which is, um, again, the first early psychosis organization in the United States. Uh, so that network sends out information about pretty much everything that goes on in the field. So with that, I am going to hand it over to, um, to Sasha. So, oh, wait, no, I take it back. I'm sorry. We were going to do a, a poll. So we have two polls. Uh, the first one is, uh, what is your role? So if you could just tell us quickly uh, what, what your role is. Hmm. There's a baby role. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we will try to be um, 
uh, muting when we're not speaking generally, but um, we don't control our dogs or babies. So, Okay, so it looks like about half of the folks are um, administrators or clinicians. We have 17% uh, who are peer support specialists already, yay. Um, a few researchers and um, uh, some other therapists. Uh, uh, yeah, looks like a lot of uh, kind of clini clinical roles, um, as well as some TA um, clinical director kinds of things. Okay, um, and does your early psychosis team have an, a peer support specialist already? Um, So some folks don't have a team, so that would be a good place, starting place. So, so it looks like it's um, kind of split. A uh, fair number of people do already have early psychosis um, or peer support specialists on their team, and then we have some folks that don't have teams yet. So a wide range of, of experience, um, and for those of you who are, who have experience in this, if you want to share information in the chat, it is an interactive process, although the, uh, our two presenters have a tremendous amount to share. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Sasha. All right, y'all. All right, so listen, we have, um, we have a short amount of time to cover a lot of ground. And so I want you to just like, just come with me on this ride we're going to take, <laughs> and and uh, and and hopefully by the by the time I finish speaking, you'll have like a, a much better sense of the the work that we're doing here at OnTrack and how we're how we're conceiving of the the peer role in, in first episode teams. So um, here's the agenda. I'll break it down for you. We're going to talk about the brief history of the peer support role. We're going to talk about um, the peer role in early psychosis programs. And then we're going to talk about important distinctions between peer workers and clinicians. And then the, the coordinated specialty care culture shift. Um, and we're going to do that in like 35 minutes. So, so let's see. OK, so this is a very important slide. So um, just as we get started, I feel like it's very important to uh, to get this one like really clear, okay? So um, when we talk about a peer and what it means to be a peer, um, you know, the dictionary definition is, is that it's, uh, you know, someone who's of equal standing with another. Um, and and it, it's really important that, that we recognize that the term peer doesn't simply refer to someone who has had a particular experience. Um, what, what, I'm, what I'm referring to and what I think most people on this call who are listening will, will you know, understand is that across the country, you know, there's more than 25,000 people who are working in peer roles, and it's very common for people to get hired into peer roles, and instead of working as a peer, you know, instead of in, instead of engaging with with other people from from a, a mutual perspective, um, they're they're basically someone who's been diagnosed with a mental illness and is doing traditional clinical work. And so it's really important that when we, uh, when we talk about the, the model, the first episode model, that that's like, we're not talking about that at all. We're not talking about hiring someone onto a team to do the stuff that other people are doing. The, the peer role is very intentionally designed to um, reflect, reflect the, uh, the, the ways that, that someone who's who struggled in the system can help somebody else who is struggling in the system. Um, so yeah, so Here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to talk to you about the, um, the history of peer support, which I think is really, really critical. I feel like this often gets lost. So it's important to remember that the peer specialist role in the mental health system has its origins in movements from the 1970s, that it really, that when we talk about peer support, it didn't start in the mental health system. It started on the street. It started in people's living rooms. It started in church basements. And it was in the era of deinstitutionalization where people were coming out of psychiatric hospitals and trying to figure out how to support each other. And it was happening in a historical context where there were a lot of other marginalized groups of people who were organizing with each other. And so we could say definitively that the peer support role actually has its origins, takes its, takes its um, the, 
its vision from the civil rights movement of the 60s and the women's liberation movement and, and gay and lesbian liberation movements and the disability justice movement. And I think that that's like, when we're thinking about the peer role, I think it's really um, important to keep that in mind. So um, as I was saying, we're, you know, the, the role originated in consumer ex-patient movements in the 70s with the aim of reforming the mental health system, because that really was the aim. It was like, you know, with the, the idea of the peer role was the, as, of someone who was a change agent who was, you know, going in to actually have an effect on changing the way the system works. Um, and that it was really adopted as a professional role in the mental health system after a lot of education and awareness. Um, and, and, uh, and when I say education and awareness, I actually mean advocacy. Because um, I, I think that that's like, you know, there, as a younger, as, a, as someone who's, um, I have a lot of respect for my elders in the peer movement who really laid the foundations for the, the work that we're doing now. Because I think that, um, you know, there's like a lot of hard work to, to get us into the system in the first place. And then we, and then it, it's really, you know, it's important to think about how the, the peer role has, has grown significantly with the rise of the recovery movement in mental health. Um, and, and I think it's important, like, as we're, we're going through these slides, I want you to consider ways in which the role started off um, as, as a peer support role, but that it's been kind of changed by the mental health system. And what we are trying to do is, is uh, basically uh, make sure that the role stays true to its roots. Um, so I think it's important to, to talk about the history, and then it's also important to talk about some of the, um, some of the recovery movement culture that exists today that's sort of affecting the, 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 peer, the peer role in the mental health system. Because I think there's a really important role um, between the, the folks who are working outside of the system and then the folks who are working in the public mental health system. And so when I say that I'm talking about um, organizations like Intentional Peer Support who are, you know, who've developed a manualized structure for, for training peer support that really focuses on mutuality and, and, um, and connection in ways that are, are explicitly not clinical. And I'm talking about, like, Howie the Harp Advocacy Center here in New York City, which, you know, um, is really, like, has a, has a really comprehensive training um, for folks who, who really struggled and who are, like, going out into the world to... Uh, to do peer support, and I'm talking about the Hearing Voices Network and Madness Radio and Mad in America, and um, I, I think I think it's uh, it, it's 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 critical for people who are working in peer roles to to understand and be connected to a larger movement that exists. That's my, that's my feeling when we talk about what it means to be a peer. Um, and I think in general, it's useful as we now like get into the slides to, to just think about how important it is to have, when we're talking about coordinated specialty care, how important it is to have one person on the team who's not coming from a clinical framework at all. In fact, the idea is that they're explicitly not thinking about the people that they're working with in, through any kind of patho pathological lens. Um, and I think it's... it's um, what you'll see, I hope, by the time you get to the end of these slides, is that the, there's a role for peers to be able to do incredible outreach and engagement, but also to have an effect on the culture of the team um, and, to, and to bring ideas into the team that, that, that wouldn't be there otherwise. So, and with that, um, so I think it's important just to, to briefly say, you know, coordinated specialty care um, is is, is growing around the country and that the, the key elements, case management, um, supportive employment education, psychotherapy, family education and support, psychopharmacology and primary care coordination um, have been there since the beginning. And that what we're talking about here and what we're doing um, at, at On Track New York is, is really um, adding this, uh, this extra element of peer support and, and, and figuring how it fits into the model. And so that's like, that's what we'll be talking about. For the for for the the time we have together. Um, okay, so I'm actually going to read to you from our our job description. So this is the, this is um, straight up, you know, this is the the job responsibilities of the of the peer. So um, outreach, engagement, and bridge building, helping to facilitate engagement with on track teams by forging strong connections with participants and families, 
undertaking outreach activities designed to promote community awareness of on-track services, encouraging help seeking, and at times serving as a bridge between team members and participants when they experience ambivalence about treatments. Um, relationship building. Developing authentic, meaningful relationships with individuals and families through empathy, uh, sharing experiences, listening and, listening and collaborating with genuine curiosity and interest. Embracing creative narratives. Peer specialists need to be able to understand, share, and discuss multiple frameworks for understanding life experiences, such as psychosis, with participants and the rest of the on-track team. Peer specialists intentionally use language in the service of listening to understand and making space for complex personal stories of recovery and resilience. And, and we're going to be covering all this stuff in the, in the following slides. But, um, so I'm going to read the, the advocacy. We, we had to take the word advocacy out of here because it was a SAMHSA slide. I'm not sure why they wanted the word advocacy out, but advocacy. Peer specialists advocate with and for program participants, both in the larger community and on the team. Co-creating support and wellness tools. Collaborate with participants to clarify their personal visions and develop their wellness toolkit, which we, we call on-track maps. Along with other team builders, peer specialists support participants in strengthening self-awareness, building life skills, and connecting to resources and community outside of the on-track team. Influencing team culture. Whenever possible, positively influencing the team culture by advocating for clients and encouraging the use of recovery-oriented language. On-track peer specialists also work actively within the team itself to help build an environment that operates from a belief in the human potential to grow and an understanding of human diversity. And finally, team communication. Peer specialists maintain open and frequent communication with the team. This includes reporting safety and other concerns directly to the team leader. Peer specialists will also keep notes on visits with program participants as required by the provider agency. In the, period, in the spirit of peer support, collaborating on reporting with the program participant is encouraged. Um, so yeah, we could talk about this one slide for an hour, but so I'm just going to keep I'm just going to keep going. And I'm going to and I'm going to say just briefly that um, the model that we use uh, is based on critical time intervention. So it's like we take these we take these aspects of the role and we put them into a framework where we think about um, the folks who are using our services are uh, you know have two years. Um, that they're in the program, and so what, like, how to, like, this is a, a way we, this is a way we, we think about, in, you know, how the, how things, how things should play out. Okay, so, important qualities of a, of a um, CSC peer specialist. So, um, you know, rather than just read all of these, I feel like I'm, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, you know, you can read these yourself. And what I'm going to say straight up, because I think this is really important to, to, to be clear about, is that, you know, there's a lot of talk about what does it mean to be a peer when you're working in coordinated specialty care in a, in a, on a first episode team, when all of the, the young people who are using services are diagnosed with a psychotic disorder. And I want to be clear that the... From our perspective, it is way we you know we have um, 14 peer specialists working in OnTrack New York, and there are a few who you know who like myself have been diagnosed with a psychotic disorder, but I would say that the the having the similar diagnosis is way less important than ability to be able to connect, and I think that um, what that often means is is um, is having more things in common and and you know I think an important thing when we're thinking about coordinated specialty care is that you know um, if we're talking about hiring young people to be peer specialists or we're talking about people who are just have the ability to to you know connect with young people I mean I think that um, that's what we're talking about and and I think that um, you know all of this all of this stuff in here that's like firsthand experience you know um, can effectively communicate, you know, a youth-oriented creative framework is really important when you're, when, you're thinking, when you're thinking about the role. But I just, I feel like that's a, that's a piece that um, when we're talking about what does it mean to be a peer, I don't think it means that you have to have the same diagnosis as someone. I think that there is, it's quite a bit deeper than that. And when we think about what it means um, engaging with someone from the perspective of a peer, um, I think it's a good contrast to think about what does it mean to be a clinician? But we'll, we'll, uh, we, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. We'll get into that shortly. So this is important, I think. Um, 
So um, when we think about like how we recruit for the roles, you know, I put at the top of this graduates of early episode programs because I think that that's like you know that we there's a couple of people who've who've graduated from on track programs who are now working as peers, and I think that that's like um, the best you can do, really. Um, but I think in general, thinking about college campuses and thinking about people who, you know, those like. My experience has been people who've recently graduated from college. Um, I think that there's, it's really important to think about the fact that we're living in a time where psychiatry in general has cast a very wide net in our society and that like there's a decent chance if you take a handful of young people that at least a few of them have been diagnosed with a mental illness and ended up, you know, having some relationship with the mental health system. And I think that it's like, it's important for us to, when we think about the growth of um, these kinds of programs where we're trying to recruit people to, to work in the peer roles, I think we should be thinking about college campuses. Um, and then there's, of course, all the, the ways that you can recruit people through, you know, online. And then there's also, you know, there's like agencies that offer vocational services and local self-help centers and mental mental health centers that have young adults or tradition traditional age youth programs, um, and I think that uh, you know there's th like one thing that I've seen like from the the place that I'm sitting in, which is like the person developing the role and trying to help teams figure out how to how to hire people, is that that you know people struggle trying to to, to hire for this role. Um, but yeah, so that's also a conversation that we can we can have. Um, since I, I don't have very much time, I just want to point you in the direction of you know the peer specialist manual that that I wrote with a with a bunch of people and Nev Jones's peer specialist manual, um, and then and then Lynn Legere and and Sarah David House manual, and you can find all of these easily on the internet. Okay. So now we're getting into like the really exciting stuff. I think this is the stuff that I, that um, when it comes down to it, for me, um, first of all, I want to I want to give a shout out to Pat Deegan, who um, is the person that when I when I got this job two years ago, I, I you know started working with her, and we were really like we developed this together, and then got we, we got a a lot of help from a lot of people. Um, but I think when it comes down to it, when we talk about the peer role on a clinical team, it's very important that we, that we have the ability to be able to draw distinctions between what it means to be a peer and what it means to be a clinician. And so the next, the next series of slides I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through, I'm going to go through that. Okay, so we're going to talk about lived experience. So, um, and this is, this is the understanding of like, the peer role in general on, on clinical teams. Someone who is a peer is required to have experienced the life-interrupting distress of some sort, typically involving psychiatric diagnosis and a history of receiving psychiatric services. That is like the understanding that, you know, of what it means to be a peer. And while some clinicians may have similar life experiences, it's not required by design of the role, whereas it is for the peer. So that, like, you know, and there's this growing system understanding, regardless of the role, of the importance of personal um, experience when supporting others. Like, I think, I, I think that... Um, anyone who's working in the mental health system today, and especially in recovery-focused areas, there's, in fact, there's this understanding that, um, being, that just being like a blank slate to, you know, the person that you're with, you know, is, is, is not that helpful, and you need to be, you need to be like a, a human being. Um, and, and so what that looks like when we're, when we're doing training, you know, so I'm like, remember, I'm a trainer. That's like the, the, the focus that I'm coming from. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about what does it mean to be the expert of your own experience and, and how all the other roles on the, the team that you're working on, people go to school to study to, to understand what that means. But your, your, um, you know, your, your expertise comes from your lived experience. Okay, here's the next one. Education. So the peer role educational emphasis is on life experience augmented by formal trainings. Formal education designed for clinicians is seen as potentially interfering with job responsibilities, right? And so um, and on the clinical end, educational emphasis is on formal training in school. Um, and I think that what that means is that as those of us who, who care about the peer role, we really need to take our augmented 
augmented formal training seriously. Um, and yeah, I'm just putting a, a slide in to show you. This is like I, I won't have time to really go into this today, but this is the main this is the main tool that peer specialists on on our coordinated specialty care program use to to train and then both work with other people. Um, and it's called on track maps, and it and it asks a series of questions. Um, from a bunch of different realms of your life and the ideas you answer them, you get together with other peer specialists, you talk about it, and then once you feel comfortable with it, then you go out um, and you engage with you engage with participants. Um, and so, yeah, so, you know, tools developed by and for people who've uh, ended up in the mental health system and are trying to change it. Okay, mutuality. So. Mutuality, so uh, from the peer end, peers focus on learning together rather than assessing or prescribing help. And I think that this language is like, I think it's very important. And it's, and it's like, it's imprecise, it's not perfect language, but it ends up being very helpful. Um, so the idea is that if you're a clinician, you know, the, the ability to assess and then to be able to help someone um, is really critical. If you're a peer, it's really important, actually, that you're not coming from the perspective that you're there to help someone. That that's actually like that that can often get in the way of being able to engage with someone. In fact, um, it's not that you would never provide help. People help each other all the time. But there's there's a there's a frame that that we train here at OnTrack that we that we come with, which is this idea that. Um, you engage as if you're learning. You're learning with the person that you're that you're you're working with. You're you're figuring things out together. And I think that that's um, that's a, you know a very critical. It's a critical difference. And um, I have this quote that's from this uh, Aboriginal woman in Australia, um, which I love. Which comes doesn't come from the the mental health world. It comes from the social justice realm. But she says, if you've come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you've come here because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let's work together. And I think that that's something. I mean, you could you could call it solidarity. I think that there's like a there's a there's. I think that it's really critical that those of us who are working in peer roles and those of us who are training people or like you know who are um, the team leaders and administrators and people that you understand you understand this difference because I think it's I think it's an important one. Okay. Self-disclosure. This is super important, and I think, like, you know, if only we, if only we were all sitting in a room together and we could just like have a conversation about this. But I'm just going to talk about it. So, peers aim to encourage mutual self-disclosure between themselves and participants. This means sharing personally relevant information and feelings in order to let themselves be known to one another. So uh, here, I'll read the, the, the clinical side. While some clinicians may disclose personal information about themselves, it's not a required or expected part of their job, and many work environments still prohibit such practices. Now, I think that it's really important when, when we're talking about self-disclosure, um, there, there's kind of two things that we're talking about here. I mean, there's a way that I've come to understand that mutual self-disclosure is something I, I, I have a friend who's a social psychologist, and she talks about how mutual self-disclosure is a basic requirement of any kind of human relationship that has intimacy. You have like that's what people do, and it's and I think it's very important to to stop and think about that. You know, traditionally clinicians don't disclose about themselves, and so you know I feel like it's important to, to just recognize that there's a lot of things that peers can do um, that clinicians, clinicians can't. Um, so that's one aspect. And then, you know, the other aspect, I think it's, um, it, I think is, it's important for us to think about how um, the ability to tell a story about yourself. I, I love this, um, this image of the, the bowl with the, that's broken and been put in back together with gold, because I think that it's like, it captures something really, something really powerful about the peer role, you know, like that, because, you know, some people do, some people do a lot to, uh, to cover up their cracks and to, you know, so that no one can see them. But the idea is if you're a peer, you have this ability to be able to, like, allow your cracks to, to shine like they're golden. And I think that that's, like, that's part of what we're going for here. Okay, so here, this is super important. So um, peer specialists have a vested interest in the impact of discrimination, prejudice, 
lack of choice, and force on individuals in the psychiatric system, and are further expected to use their stories and other tools to help raise consciousness of these issues among coworkers. Now this obviously goes back to, if we think about the origins of the peer role and where it came from, and the idea of you know, people who had used mental health services and had a hard time, the, the, the ability to be able to like come back in and not just share with the participants you know, who, who, who may be struggling, but also to be able to share those experiences with their other team members. And I think that's super, super important. So while some clinicians may have similar experiences, awareness of these issues is not a basic job requirement. And in fact, it's often a struggle to fully understand impact if one has not had the personal experience of this nature. So if you haven't had the experience of being held down and shot with psyche, you know, with, with like Haldol, you know, it would be very hard to understand like what that experience would be like. If you, you know, you, you might be able to like have some other, you know, experience you've had in your life where you've been oppressed and you could, you could understand it. Um, but there's, there's this idea of, um, you know, well, most people, regardless of their role, are invested in reducing discrimination and prejudice of people with psychiatric diagnoses. People with psychiatric diagnoses have the ability to be able to talk about their experiences in ways that are, um, you know, that just like cut to, cut to the core of, you know, I guess allow people to be able to feel less alone. And I feel like that's, um, you know, while both peers and clinicians are working on coordinated specialty care teams, a key difference in their roles is that clinicians have been trained to see themselves as part of a system, and peers see themselves as both part of a system and outside of it. And I think that's like really, that, that's, you know, that, that goes back to what we're talking about, like that, you know, peers are, like if you're working on a coordinated specialty care team, you are on that team and those are your team members, and at the same time, you have this understanding and ability um, because you're, you're, you're connected to a larger, you're a larger movement. Um, it's well understood that, that an important aspect of recovery involves addressing discrimination and transcending shame and stigma. What this means for participants of CSC programs um, that have a peer specialist is that they're more likely to feel heard and seen by someone else who's experienced similar discrimination. It also means that the team has this opportunity to learn from their fellow mem members about what it can feel like to be on the other side of treatment. And I feel like that's just like super critical. Um, and, I, and I think that, um, you know, I, I see that there's 78 people who are, you know, listening to and watching this, and, and I imagine that you're, you're at a, a variety of different kinds of agencies and institutions, and, and um, I think, you know, I think it's really important we just keep that in mind when we talk about the peer role. This is a, a, a key aspect of it. Okay, and then here's the last one. So people in the peer role focus on the many ways to understand the experience of psychosis. Biopsychosocial, spiritual, cultural, Psychosis is teacher. Psychosis is a natural variation of human experience, and and I think that like this is you you may recall from the job description, and we talk about the importance of um, you know embracing multiple frameworks, and I think that that's that's a really really critical piece when we're talking about first episode programs that we have um, we like that there, that we we keep our mind open to to multiple frameworks of thinking about things. You know that that having um, you know, if everybody in our program has been diagnosed with a non-affective psychotic disorder, that may be really useful for being able to navigate services and thinking about like what might be helpful or might not, but it really is not going to serve people well to like, especially like a young person, like walking around with a, a diagnosis like that, you know? And I think that like, it's part of our, out of our job to help people understand the role of diagnosis and where that fits and then the point at which it's like, it's not, you know, it's not important, and we need to be able to uh, think about, like, there's, there's, like, I mean, in some ways, it's like, there's all these different ways to look at the human experience and think about, you know, the, what a lot of my friends like to, to call extreme states of consciousness and what it means to, to have an extreme state and what, you know, what does psychosis actually mean, and in different cultures, it means different things, and we're living in a, we're living in a society that arguably is, is not that healthy psychologically, and so like how, like how do we talk about ourselves as individuals? How do we talk about ourselves as like, you know, part of something larger? That's, that, that's the idea behind, behind thinking about um, multiple, multiple frameworks. Okay, so um, 
we're, we're, we're getting towards the end here. So the, the coordinated specialty care culture shift. So, um, so Pat, who I mentioned before, who's just been around the system a long time and who really, you know, I think was one of the people who like coined the term recovery in mental health, um, uses this language of disruptive innovators to describe the peer role and talks about the culture shift that takes place when a peer joins the clinical team. And that's how, in, in our model at OnTrack, we think about the peer role and the relationship to the culture shift. And so I, I, I don't have the slides to talk about it, but just like pay attention to what I'm saying. A key piece of what we do at, at OnTrack is we have, um, we, we don't just train the peer specialists. We make, we, like, we make sure that all of the people who are supervising peer, peer specialists um, are trained and really understand the role and really understand the, um, the, like, all, all these different aspects that I'm talking about. Um, and we have a collaborative where we bring all of the team leaders together on a call every month and we talk about what's going on with the peer specialists and we frame it in this context of the culture shift and the things that the, um, the, the different stages of, 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 a, of a shift on the team. And I, and I think it's really important for us to understand um, the reason that I spent all that, that time and energy breaking down what does it mean to be a peer and what does it mean to be a clinician is that it's like that's the only way that you can really see how, how different roles can work together, you know, if there's, if there's clarity about them. Um, and the, this understanding that in, in order to it's super, super critical for a peer specialist on a team to have a good relationship with their team leader because, frankly, this model where we only have one peer specialist on a team is, is pretty problematic. And it's really important that if you are the peer on the team, that you have at least one other person who has your back and understands where you're coming from, who you're having intimate conversations with and talking about. And so the way that we've the way we've framed it and formulated it, that person is the team leader, um, and so supervision is like a really key aspect of, of the model. Um, and so understanding that there's built into the design of the team are natural differences and perspectives of its members because of their varying roles. I think it's really useful to remember that, um, you know, at, at least my understanding of things is that a healthy team, there's going to be disagreement. Like, people aren't always going to, there's like, People, it's important that people, um, you know, agree on the fundamental things, but that having different perspectives can be really healthy. And that if there's an environment where someone who's a peer feels comfortable talking about their experiences and is like welcomed into it, that's um, that. There's a power in that. Like that, there's a power in that 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 doesn't exist, and that I've seen. I have to say, like I, I've seen on team um, on teams around the country where peer people in peer roles feel very alienated and shut down and feel like they can't talk or they feel like they're constantly in combative mode or they just have to you know, be like everybody else. And so I feel like that's, like, that's what we're talking about here. Um, and so finally, these multiple perspectives can become assets which ideally create a robust perspective and analysis that can benefit the team, um, you know, both the team and the participants. Um, by respecting the peer role as clearly distinct from clinical roles, while still part of a clinical team, there's a great opportunity for creative shifting dynamics on early psychosis teams in a positive direction. So, um, so with that, I'm just gonna I'm I'm just gonna give props to some of the the people and organizations that you know have inspired this work, and just say that the the people who are um, working on my team at OnTrack Central are all brilliant, and I feel really lucky to to be here, um, and I feel lucky that they, like, I get to be the, the guy, you know, the one guy diagnosed with a psychotic disorder who can, like, you know, share my opinions and people, people take me seriously, and that's a huge deal. Um, and, you know, in, in no small thanks to, to Pat Deegan being around. Um, and then there's a, you know, I just, I just want to give props to the, to the larger community that has helped birth these ideas um, and, and just finally say, you know, it's all a work in progress, and we're we're gonna we're gonna keep um, we're gonna keep working on it. But I hope that I hope that over the last uh, you know forty you know period of time, I uh, I I said some interesting stuff. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So I'm <laughs> I'm gonna pass Sasha, it on to I, John. Yeah. Sasha, can I ask you a quick question since we still have a couple minutes left? Um, 
Sure. Can, there was a there was a question about uh, working side by side with a psychiatrist, and you know, so there a question about so does that mean that you don't work side by side with a psychiatrist? So can you talk just a little bit more about your role with other members of the team? So you know, in the on track model, there's a psychiatrist, and there's it's actually it, it's actually really important. I mean, it depends on you know, it depends on what you mean by side by side. You know, like there's like the, in in our model, and I think this is true with all coordinated specialty care. The the team meeting is a really critical place where a lot of really inf important information gets decided. And being in that being in that space and and being able to engage with a psychiatrist totally critical, you know, and important. Um, ha like having a psychiatrist who understands the role of a peer and gets it, and yeah. like what, like I think that that's really important. And that's just like, uh, and and I'm not talking about. I'm, this, this, yeah. I'm not speaking to the peers now. I'm speaking to the people who are administrators and the people who like understand how how things get designed. It's really important that everyone on the team understands everything that I just said in the slide deck. And, mm -hmm. and, and with that understood, yes, working side by side yeah. with psychiatrists. And I think there's, there was a, one more clarification from Emily, thanks, that um, the question was really about um, working side by side with your former psychiatrist um, oh. who <laughs> treated you on the same team. And, and that might be a discussion that we hold off on until after, um, after Jonathan talks, um, but I think it's an important one. Right on. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a. I feel like that's a larger. That's, that's like a larger question. Um, so, yeah. Unless you have more questions for me, I am. Uh, I I'm happy. I'm super curious to hear. John and I like we've never actually met in person, but we've been yeah. corresponding and talking. So I'm psyched to. I'm psyched to hear what you have to say, man. That was great, Sasha. That was really great description of the peer role and I think implied in that is that there is going to be conflict and conflict can be a good thing if everybody understands what their role is, but that's an issue I'll get into. And conflict can, can generate innovation, solutions, but if, but if people get too emotional or caught up in their point of view and not listening to the other people, it can, it can be destructive and unfortunately in my experience observing the implementation of the peer role overall, that's been a real source of uh, distress for peer specialists and I think for the um, providers too, because there are two pieces of this. One is we have the, the, the peer being hired, that guy is up to some, that person's up to something, a person, and the provider is struggling in, in many cases with implementing this role on multiple Friends, and it's different. It's not an easy thing to do because it's an innovation, and we're still kind of working on it and developing it and seeing what works. So, you know, it's just being open-minded. And what I intend to cover in a real, um, you know, brief way is a broad thinking about how we can approach um, this from a provider first episode perspective or administrative. So I kind of take a step back. Because I don't think we in, in psychiatry or in, we really talk about what it takes to work. We have models, but I don't know where those models necessarily come from. Um, I, I tend to think more broadly about that. So I talk about factors impacting the employment success of people with mental health conditions generally and peer specialists in first episode programs specifically. Um, then I give you my framework for addressing implementation challenges because that's even better in many ways than the specific tips. You want to be working from a framework, what impacts what in the organization. And finally, I'll go over parts of the um, toolkit that I developed with Vanessa Klodnick from Threshold, who, you know, does this work as well there. And, um, you know, she's wonderful to work with and her input is, is greatly appreciated in this toolkit. Um, that's the website for our Samson Nidler funded organization that does provide the technical assistance if anybody is interested for, for no cost. Um, so this is where you can find the toolkit. There's a PDF version and there's an online version. Sometimes the online version is easier to um, manage, but you know you can. We have chapters in there that address many of the key issues. I have one in front of me here, including establishing organizational culture, recruiting and hiring, 
affecting supervision, um, addressing significant job difficulties with a focus on reasonable accommodations, preparing and engaging non-peer staff, infrastructure and framework. So that's available, and I'll talk somewhat about that. But first, I want to talk about the factors that, that input that impact employment success for, for, in this case, peer specialists who are young adults, in, in particular, first episode programs. So I did a study with Vanessa, a qualitative study where we talked to um, supervisors of young, young adult peer specialists and young adult peer specialists, and, and, and these were people who had felt, who felt good about what they were doing, both, both the peer specialists and supervisors. We wanted to see what was working. So there were two broad factors that really came across. And one is the nature of this job in particular. It's not a common kind of job. You know, and there's complexities. There's complexities to being a clinician. And then there are complexities to using your own story and, and trying to work with people or work around who, who are struggling. I mean, that, that's not easy stuff. And then there's sort of the part of maneuvering within the organization to, to, get, to work with a psychiatrist. And that's hard. You know, you're, you're a single person or in a large organization, and it can feel very, very isolating. Um, so there's complexities to this. But the rewards are really, you know, of course, astounding if you are connecting with someone, and over time, they get better. Um, you probably have something to do with it as a peer specialist. And the people we talk to, and I feel the same way about this as an employment specialist, it's just so rewarding to see people improve because people do recover. I mean, I'm not going to say everybody does, but, you know, a person can start in a really bad place. And, some, and I can see from personal experience, <laughs> and having been on Social Security Disability myself, is that there can be a path, and the peer really provides the hope. Um, an, an example of that happening. It's really a, a peer specialist is a spark, but also a guide in many ways. So in terms of the, um, I, like the I like the capital framework for kind of understanding this. In the capital framework, capital is basically resources. What resources are there to um, make this job a success. Am I still up there? Let's see. I can't tell. So, so in this model, and this is not a model, this is a model that exists, we fine-tuned it a bit. There is, um, and I'll go over these, human capital, what people know, and this we're talking about peer specialists, what they know, their training, cultural capital, and culture, here's the culture of the organization, and, and then how well the, peer, the peers' capital is how well they can adjust to organizational culture or even change it. Now, psychological capital is something that hasn't been talked about, but that's the, the um, self-efficacy of an employee. This is, you know, to persist or otherwise handle difficult situations on a job and just hang in there. I think we've all been there. We've had difficult jobs and kind of, sometimes you gotta put your head down, but those people tend to naturally tend to do a little bit better. Personal social capital uh, is are really the people in your life, um, very important, significant others, friends, children, um, and organizational capital is what we will, we will focus on here. And that is the employer. That's the provider. That is what's within the organization, um, the people. So again, with human capital, there's a negative that human capital for some young adults who have criminal histories or school incompletions. Now, when I say negative, that's the perspective of many employers. It's not my perspective, but, but for the people who are doing the hiring, they, they may find ways to, you know, cut people back, but uh, education and prior jobs can be seen as a positive capital. One of my hopes here is to turn criminal history in, into positive capital, um, or should be seen as positive capital in many ways because a person has overcome so much, they're a natural for other people to help to work with other people who have overcome a great deal. So um, culture, So these are like the challenges for young adults. So for cultural capital, job and experience, as I think people know, make it difficult to adapt to a job. 
you got to start somewhere. A lot of young adults haven't had that experience um, who have mental health conditions. And, you know, they may not have had it. If they were in the system, they don't necessarily have role models to give them sort of the playbook on how to work, or appear to do work. But, you know, most of us kind of know this, and that's why, I mean, it's just taken me a while to learn, but, but that's how you, you got to find a way of, of, of sort of fitting in without totally fitting in in this job. The psychological capital, we have motivation. And with motivation, we know is a, can be an issue for people with um, first episode. And, um, you know, it, it's, we, if we're employing people with first episode, we have to kind of tap into that. And I'll talk to you about that. Um, you know, significant others really impact our jobs. In, in our study, you know, we had someone who was working as a peer specialist and she would come home and her boyfriend would say, what are you doing this for? It's a waste of time. I mean, that really impacted her ability to do the job. Um, a supportive significant other, the opposite. I think this is kind of self-evident, but as an employer, I, I want to, I don't know what I can do about that, but I still want to be aware of it and provide support to my employee. Family, you know, that, that's the same sort of thing. A lot of these young adults now have, have children. Um, they may be single parents and child care. And, and, and maybe the family can help them with child care. Oftentimes they don't have a lot of money. So um, that's something we should be aware of as employers. Again, maybe we can do, maybe we can help somebody. Maybe we have child care in our new organization and the person doesn't know about it. Again, workplace social capital, and we're going to show how, how this works. So this is the workplace, the green. In the workplace is people. You have the peer over here who interacts with other staff and interacts with the supervisor, and the supervisor can interact with other staff, and that's the culture. Um, it's about people. It's about belief systems. Um, it's about, you know, how, how – how things, how um, practices are, are done, how tr treatment occurs, and that rises up to kind of like standards of a place. Then you have like employment supports over here. I don't want to minimize employment supports, and so I, I do that. Um, but once a person's employed in the workplace, that, that is, to me, and that's what is the biggest factor in a person's success, regardless of what, you know, an employment specialist can only do so much in many cases. If, if, if it's a toxic environment, the employment specialist probably can't change that. We can sort of change, help things at the margins. I'm, I work with people now who are becoming, who are taking on this role, and I happen to have relationships with providers, so, you know, I'm in a position to be a little helpful, but I'm not going to change their culture. I know there are certain providers that are really good, and I'd like to see the people I'm working with work there, and there are other places where I think, I'm not sure they should be work in there. Um, so those places need to think about how they're changing the culture. And again, I'm over here in this blue box, um, employment support. So I'll, I will do the best I can, but there's only so much I can influence I can have of a, on a workplace. All right. So, so what a workplace can do, organizational social capital. Our hope, Vanessa and mine, is that the employer can improve the psychological capital of of the young adult peer through supervision, accommodations, access to health care, wellness supports, a job coach, um, and having positive values. And, you know, motivation, I, I connect with a lot of young adults who have been through psychosis, and it's building a trusting relationship. I don't think, you know, that's how I, that's, I mean, I'm not a peer specialist, so that's kind of how I, work with them and, and motivate them to move forward. It's really, you know, connecting at that level because there are a lot of people who may even take a job who may still be at kind of a pre-contemplation phase as to what they want to do, and they come in there, and um, they may not be um, clear on what they're supposed to do. So I think it's a job of the employer to really give a person a slap on the back if they do a good job wherever you can, like any good employer. The supervisor will talk about that a little bit. You know, it's increased job satisfaction, 
leads to, you know, increased performance and retention. That's another thing I emphasize. If we hire someone and they're pretty good, we want to keep them. We don't want to lose them to bouts of, oh, I don't know if I can do this. And that can happen with, with a lot of young adults we know. So we don't want to lose those good employees. So it's up to the, it's up to the employer to kind of understand that with the peers they work, they're hiring. And, and really, just like with any employee, really, um, you know, promote them and, and um, support them. So now, the, I, I have a list of workplace challenge, broad scale workplace challenges because this isn't easy. It's an innovation, and we're still learning, and that's why we work, we develop the toolkit. But I think the biggest initial barrier is job lack of job clarity, job confusion, and even questions about the perceived value. If other staff don't know <laughs> what the job is, they don't, they might feel threatened are confused when, when, the, when the peer specialist is advocating for the voice of, of the young adult in the treatment team meeting. Now, if they should know that's the person's job and that a little conflict is okay and they can, they can have a good discussion with the peer specialist. But I think there is a tendency also to shut, they can be, to shut the peer specialist off or just ignore them. Um, or sometimes staff can take a, a negative view and carry that forward into the culture of the place. Um, so I'll talk about how we can address that. This is, you know, relations with and support of other staff, big difference, you know, the psychiatrist included. That person, I think that's one of the most important people because that person prescribes and I, I would like my, I would like someone working with a psychiatrist to be really involved in decision making. Um, so it's likely that we may have some positive interactions and, and even friendship. But, um, you know, addressing job difficulties, I'll talk about that because people do have job difficulties and do we just fire them or there's things we, a lot of things we can do. Wellness support, organizational culture, organizational freedom. So here's what I've seen in employer vases having worked with them, provider faces. So I've seen their biggest concern perhaps is, and this is their perspective, is the reliability of the peer specialist to show up on time, to stay on the job, um, to have the, to even have the skills to do the job. The result is turnover, and turnover is not a good thing. It, 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 it's, um, you know, it's costly to an organization. It puts pressure on other employees. It's a legitimate concern if that's what they see as reliability, but and that, we have to work with employer. Empl there are ways for employers to kind of look at this. And, and as um, Sasha was saying, part of it is, is widening the recruitment pool. Like there are college students who are maybe ca very capable and prepared to hold these jobs than other people you know, who are maybe not. And you definitely need reliable people, but you have to make the effort to support people in their reliability and to find them. That goes to the second point. I hear there are not enough good peer specialists. Well, people aren't really looking for, high, they put ads in the paper or, um, you know, they put it on, on different websites. That's not how people get jobs. And I'll talk about that for the most part in a second. And there's the cost benefit uncertainty that relates to the above. You're, want, you're always wondering when you start to work in hiring the peer specialist, like, how is this going to hurt me? Now I get to spend time on implementation. And, you know, I understand when you're an employer, you're looking at something new and you're kind of weary of it. But that's where um, it's important for the employer to understand the real benefits of employing a peer specialist. We we'll talk about that in the toolkit, but. I mean, there studies are not, it's clear that a person at the very least starts to, they may not have ever thought about recovery and then they meet a peer specialist. They meet, that pushes them up a few steps. So, you know, if a person takes more charge of their life and, and has more confidence, they're more likely to move forward beyond that. So I, there's no question in my mind from what I've seen of the benefits. Uh, and for the peer, 
they're wondering like, what is this job? A lot of severe specialists they haven't had a lot of training and, um, you know, and the provider doesn't really know. So they're wondering what their job is. Supervision has to be good. The culture clash, we'll talk about um, opportunities for what I call evidence-based wellness programs. And they're wondering like, what if I get sick? And that goes to social security. Um, they may be wondering, boy, if I don't do well here, I want, I might not be able to go right back on social security. Now, there are is the ticket to work program and, and others that we, I think it's up to the employer to know about these, um, to encourage um, people to apply for jobs because those may be some of your best people and you know, they, they, they might be, may not be knowledgeable about what their opportunities to, to work without social security and employers should really know this if they want the best people. You want to remove the barriers to work because the peer is thinking like, boy, I'm not sure about this full time that is. So, you know, there's startup costs, operations, personal output, and here are the benefits as I talked about. There is improved engagement, satisfaction, wellness outcomes, and navigation of the system. So employers really need to take a broad view and really um, think about what what they need to change and then what the what, how they can help the peer specialists. Um, Oops. I'm looking for comments. Huh? All right, so this is what you do in first episode programs. And again, the first thing I say is the most important. Define and clarify the peer specialist role for all staff before hiring and with HR. I mean, this goes back to, you know, recruiting. How do we get jobs? We meet people who know about jobs. And therefore, if I'm running an organization, I want my entire staff to know what the peer specialist job is because they may come across someone who says, you know, my son is not doing well, he's had no health problems, but he's now starting to looking for work. You know, if an administrative and assistant at a program should be able to say, you know, I know about a job that he might be interested in. So granted, people generally know what nurses are, social workers, and this role is new, but it's important and it's growing. In Massachusetts, it's like, you know, there's more than a few in many of the programs. Um, so it's an advantage to, for people to really know about it in the hiring process. You know, hiring is like in anything else. It's, it, it's the amount of effort you put into it and how, how much you, you cast your net before hiring. And, you know, we don't, we don't want HR to step in at the last minute and say, um, well, we don't have that classification. But that's not, that's really our fault if we're not talking to HR early on and bringing them along and explaining how this might be a different classification of the job. So I've already addressed this and enhanced, this is, this is a broad list, I'm going to address each, more or less each of these. Um, promote workplace culture that supports peer specialists. Well, all right, that's, that's um, in the first episode programs. Again, you know, most first episode programs are, from what I've seen, you know, clinically oriented. So there has to be a specific focus on thinking about culture. On the other hand, because this is a new model, it promotes opportunities to include the peer specialist and less is set in stone. So that's why I kind of like this area because I think that people realize there's a lot of thinking about implementation, including what the role of the peer specialist is. So there is room for, this is a, even the first episode program is a fairly a recent innovation. Educate and support non-peer staff. We, we, we want to be, we want to be able to at least have, be cordial with the other staff. Establish effective supervisory practices. This might be the most important thing. Um, supervisors can make or break you in a job. Um, in this job as a peer specialist where you're potentially isolated with your role, not getting a lot of understanding, you know, that supervisor can really help you get over some of that. Address job difficulties, you know, whether it be being late or um, not being able to do the job, just like you would with anybody. Um, wellness, resilience, and self-care. 
it, it, you know, it, you might have um, walking groups. Walking is an evidence-based approach to, to kind of helping people feel better, and that creates opportunity for peers to both feel better or, or continue their wellness and meet other people. And I won't get into the critical elements of organizational infrastructure, because then, you know, that's in the booklet, but it's really leadership's buy-in, you know, the director. I think that's what Sasha was saying is, you know, it, it, it's good, you know, the director of your first episode program really needs to buy in. Um, so I mentioned this, and I think there's an approach, I think this job gets sold short. I mean, and people see it sometimes as just another thing, a throwaway. And, but however, this job requires a lot of skill. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's not just anybody who's had lived experience, as Sasha was saying, it's qualities around empathy, um, understanding, and I'd say reliability too. Um, we all want reliability. And, that you have to build that kind of job description. There are unique features to this job that we've talked about, and that should be clear when you're hiring. Um, then you want to define the functions, which may differ to a degree based on certain aspects, but the, the core features remain. Then you want to look at those two things, and that's where you establish job qualifications. So the people really need an MBA or something. No, it doesn't make sense. Generally, what I've seen is people need a high school degree or the equivalent, and that makes sense to me, personally. Um, you know, some people are still in college, are fighting through their education and going through that challenge, and that puts them in an excellent position to be a peer specialist, because they can share their successes and challenges as they're doing it in their point of wellness. Um, and I think Sasha mentioned this. People don't have to, I don't think, have specifically a first episode psychosis. That's really a recent phenomenon in a sense. It, it, it's been around for a long time that that terminology is, you know, in the widespread use. People have lived experience of services and looking for jobs and dealing with these mental difficulties in the mental health system. Then you have the clear job description. Get it to everybody and even have trainings and orientation for all staff on what this job is and why it's important. The manual, the toolkit has that. So there's a little bit about, you know, um, having conferences or what I really like is having an employer who really didn't like it at first, but then employed a peer specialist and was converted. Those are the people you want speaking at your organization, um, true believers. Established job qualifications. Criminal history should have a minimal role, if any, in determining whether a person is, is um, eligible for, for a job um, because a lot of people with mental health conditions and young adults can be, get caught up in the criminal justice system, um, whether it be a conviction or not. And we spend a lot of time at my program trying to, you know, help them reduce charges and that sort of thing. But if I'm hiring, I, if, a, if a person hasn't been convicted, that doesn't, you know, I'm going to consider them, and in fact, um, they can be even better. And there's more, we have links to websites in there, more different relevant to barriers. Okay. And I'm going to go through this quickly because um, I've mentioned the first thing, the ban the box movement that people know about, do not have on your job application a question of a criminal history. Because you will have people who have charges against them or weren't convicted running the other direction, you will reduce your recruitment pool just by asking that question. That's something you save until way later down the line. People, so, and, and there's actually laws and regulations in many states regarding this. Um, you, can, you know, if a person has a criminal history, you can, you can either, and, and they don't feel that they qualify, you can either say, all right, you don't qualify, goodbye, or you can talk to them about it and see if the, their charges can be expunged or removed from the record. And you can help the person with that. I even give them the links we have here on, on how to get help. 
But again, it's so easy to narrow your pool of peer specialists where you're not getting the choices you'd rather have. You want to expand that. I'm going to rifle through this. Organizational culture, the recovery oriented versus clinical. Biggest issue I find is self-determination and dignity of risk. That's something Kat Egan, who I greatly admire too, um, really talked about. The, the being a person doesn't require you to make every right decision. It requires you to, it, it allows for you to learn from mistakes, particularly young adults at that developmental stage. Um, granted, we don't want them getting too much in, in trouble, but any young adult, you, you, I think you have to give some degree of freedom, whether it be traveling to Europe or um, whatever, and there's going to be a degree of risk. So you have to really think about that when you're working with, with young adults. And that's, so that's the, how the peer specialist sees things. And if the clinicians see things differently, like, you know, we're going to make this people, their person take medications because, um, are we going to really, we're not going to, we're not going to tell the person they have options. There's going to be a clash there between peer and clinician. And we want to establish a culture in the provider that accepts within the youth development approach, self-determination and dignity of risk. And people can, does an organization really buy into that? I'm not going to, uh, I kind of talked about that. You, you really have to, this is, peer specialists are consistent with the positive youth development paradigm, helping people, young adults build capacity to get better and not just, it's not just helping them. And if the clinical culture doesn't buy into that, um, there will be clashes. We can address stereotyping the workplace as the peer specialist just being there should have some effect. Again, you know, self-determination is a presumption of competence. And this is a big challenge for parents and guardians. So you're kind of in the middle of this. The peer specialist is dealing with a clinician, the parents and the guardian, perhaps in, in, in the young adult. And I think I'm, I'm aligned with the young adult as a peer specialist and I'm promoting their voice. And that, that's sort of a three-party crash in a sense. But if people understand the peer specialist role and that's what they're supposed to do, then it will take some of the edge off the clinician. And, you know, family members need, they're traumatized too. So they need support in thinking how their young adult can recover and learn those things. Um, this is just a repeat of the same slide. More on, I won't go into this too much, but I, I have, these are all the basic things of recovery on the care. Um, I've done some short workshops for first episode um, programs, and this one's on shared decision making, because I think shared decision making to a degree misses the point that it, you're really starting with informed consent, I'm going to finish up quickly here, that an individual has a right to make decisions for themselves, bad or good, and that's where a psychiatrist the clinician should start. And then you can enter into a shared de decision making phase, but ultimately it, it, it's up to the young adult, I think, unless you get a guardianship, and, but the shared decision making model does allow for trust building, discussion of risks and side effects. Um, so, and this is another thing that comes up in first episode programs quite a bit. A, a clinician meets a young adult who, and I'm saying this because a peer specialist sees, may see it one way and a clinician another way. The, the psychiatrist feels that if the person goes off medications, they'll be like at risk for running away or um, another you know, episode of, um, psychosis. So often the goal of the clinician is prevention of further psychosis and safety, good, good stuff. Um, whereas, and that's a short-term focus, I would say, though. And the longer-term focus that I think the recovery culture is also focused on is building trust and personal growth per developmental stage. So these aren't, so there are, this is at least four factors. It's the clinician really can learn from the peer specialist about this, and we do trainings, I do trainings, this is the training I do, um, and we have critical competencies for psychiatrists, it's not in the scope of here, but, you know, but by, by providing training to your staff, you, you can, around recovery oriented care, you help the peer specialist, because they're, they're less isolated. I'm not gonna go into this too much, except to say, I can, I can, I can, um, so there are several ways in which peer specialists disclose 
by being there and how they engage people. And the other point I like to make is other, other professionals are, are, can disclose too. It's just a matter of emphasis. It's within the code of ethics of psychologists and social workers to use their personal um, story if it's for the benefit of the client and it, it doesn't harm the client. The only the major difference is it's part of the peer, it is the peer specialist job, but clinicians should do it and they're not as far apart from peers as they think they are. So when they ask why are you disclosing, it's like you can do that as a social worker. You can do that as a social worker and psychologist too, if you want. Um, so, so the question we had was about, I think, a psychiatrist, and I'll finish up here and I can just refer to the other side. The question is, Working next to your former psychiatrist or your current, well, let's say your former psychiatrist. So my view on this is you start with the benefits of hiring an ex-client. They can be the best guide for current clients because they know the program, they know the geographic area. And what, a, what an amazing benefit to have someone who's been through it, working with people who are going through it. Um, and they have direct evidence of recovery for the program. So you have clients who might buy into the program or if they meet someone who's benefited. So there's great advantages to that. And I always, I just ask the question, why not have a clinician and former client work on the same team? Why not? I think that's primarily an issue for the clinician. Um, so, so I don't think it's an ethical issue. I think it's a management issue. You know, it, there are ethical issues when you're interacting with clients and you're not, both in the peer code, you, you, you really can't, you're not supposed to take advantage of people. But in this case, what I would think about doing is that psychiatrist might need some training and, and the team might need, might, to, might need to be brought along to the idea that, you know, A, ex-clients can be, have an extreme advantage in your program. So why wouldn't we help the clients who are trying to help? And B, that we gotta get used to it because we're, clients work in a rural area, this might be the only program. Um, we might want to set up something so that if the person isn't well, they go to another provider. But, um, you know, that's part of the education and culture piece that our former clients can be helpful to our clients um, as much as anybody. So the rest of this integrating team activities, getting to know the other staff, group meetings, in peer specialists introducing themselves to other um, staff saying who, what their role is and who they are. People will find com commonality. Psych a psychiatrist and, and peer specialists will have many commonalities perhaps, maybe around riding motorcycles. I find that psychiatrists like, will often talk about how they ride their motorcycles. Um, but peer specialists might ride motor motorcycles too. That can really bring people together. So I'm just, it's supervisory practice quickly. Um, no, supervisors, you need to know the job. And second, you need to advocate. You have to be a good supervisor, but you really need to advocate for your peer specialist with other staff. I'm not gonna, so Vanessa Klodnik is the expert on supervision specifics in this area. Can't go into it, but she just came out with a manual with, with the state on doing that, and I can sort of send around a reference to that. So she's the person to talk to on supervision. I do work on reasonable accommodations and how we can help people um, address problems by providing greater supports. There's a lot about that in the toolkit. And the rest of this is in the toolkit. Um, champions, as they talked about, the mission statements that reflect it. Here are references. And um, Nate, so everybody needs to know what this job is. I probably haven't said that enough. That will reduce the emotional conflict. That will make people feel better about their jobs and how it relates to the peer specialist. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, John. Uh, this has been a, a really uh, packed uh, webinar with all kinds of yeah. information and lots of great questions coming up. So um, for the questions that don't get answered, we're gonna uh, do some follow-up um, and see if we can put some some answers in, in writing for you, as well as talking, talking about having an additional um, session uh, just for Q&A. Um, so 
Um, I'll, I'll try to throw out a couple of the questions that have come up um, while we still have a few minutes. Um, first one is about um, supervision by folks who are not peer support specialists and um, how do you um, address that and how do you kind of move a system to the point where that, that type of supervision can happen? Want to take that, Sasha? Yeah, I'll start. Sure. I'm, so at first I want to say, you all, I mean, that's a great question, and it's not a question that I, I feel like has, it just wasn't, it, I just didn't have the ability to, uh, when I got this job, to put things into place that way. I mean, I feel like the, like I ended up putting energy into developing a peer supervision checklist so that the team leader would, you know, have an, an an understanding of what the, the role was with this understanding that that people working in peer roles have connection to uh, to to other people working in peer roles but man there's you know there's definitely definitely work to be done and I and and like I recognize that I'm not the I am I, I, I take a lot of uh, flack for it by the way from my people well, in my community I have an opinion about this in my research shows that it, it, super, being a good supervisor is not about your classification in life. It's how you supervise people and your knowledge and your, your caring about the job and advocacy. I've seen many good supervisors who are peer specialists, and maybe in the future we'll have enough. But um, to me, it doesn't matter so much, frankly, as long as the person knows the job. And maybe they should go to a peer specialist training themselves. Uh, maybe we, it, it sort of enhances the role. So that's just my opinion. I mean, I'll say one more one more piece. I mean, in the, the thing is, if what we're if if one of the if one of the big issues with the peer specialist role is that there's no career ladder, there's no career career ladder. Like the career ladder isn't going to grow if uh, people can't you know work their way up to supervisory roles. So I, I really get it, and uh, yeah, I think I'm not I'm not sure how not sure how it will play out. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a great question, um, and I think it also, you know, it has a lot of parallels. Like, you know, if you're a licensed psychologist and you're being, you know, supervised mm -hmm. by a social worker, um, how do you get additional supervision? You know, so I, I, there are probably avenues that parallel some of the other disciplines, um, but it's it's definitely an important conversation. Um, Another question um, was, if you are a peer support specialist on a team where the, um, there hasn't been a peer support specialist before, what's your advice about how to explain your role? Oh, I think that the, the, the presentation that, that I did breaking down, like what is a clinician, what is a peer, like what are the, I think that, that that's a really, that's the clearest way that, that I've I found to explain it, and um, you can find that you you know you you can find a less updated version of that in the in the OnTrack uh, team manual, um, and in general in the OnTrack peer specialist manual. There you know, but I think that that like making it clear what you know what does it mean to be a peer you know, and then what does it mean to be a clinician, and where is the overlap? Very important. And I and I think you know I was looking at a discussion that was going on in the. Um, in the chat box and people were talking about, well, what about case management? Like, where does case management fit in? And there was like a whole lively conversation between like Ashley and Katie and Jessica and Nicole and Steven and the, um, and I think that, you know, obviously one of the things that comes up is that teams are underfunded and understaffed and so people end up having to do the things, you know, what's, what's required to keep the team going together. And that's a real issue. Like, you know, like I think that it's, um, I think that, that if what it gets down to for me is like this like level of disrespect for the role where it's like okay well we're paying you less money than everybody else and we're expecting you to do the same things as everybody else that's like that it's very problematic and and I and obviously who am I to say from my office here in Manhattan like what people should be doing in other places but I, I feel like that's we got you know we have to we have to advocate for ourselves in the role. So I just want, from my perspective, and I have, I talk about the four unique qualities of the job that's in both our book, one of the slides, using the recovery story, and explaining why this is important. 
I would walk around with a copy of your code of ethics wherever you go because people don't know that this is a real deal. They think it's made up. But we have, there's a professional code of ethics to being a peer specialist to help explain disclosure issues. Or, so you want to be, I do, you want to be prepared with a, you know, I think I went over some ways to explain things around self-determination. Um, but you, there are tangible things you can walk around with, like the code of, your code of ethics. Yeah. We don't have a code of ethics in New York State that is analogous to what you're talking about. Really? Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. I think, but, but there's, a, well, we have in Massachusetts, so that's what I know. Yeah. And, and there are some, you know, there's some national resources, um, and, you know, PEPnet has a lived experience work group where we may want to start uh, getting people together where if, you, you know, one site doesn't have a code of ethics, you know, maybe you can draw on on another place. Um, there's so many important issues being raised, uh, questions about, you know, older, you know, if you have older peer support specialists versus younger peer support specialists, and then kind of fundamental issues around, you know, when is, when are you um, really intent, you know, what's the difference between a real member of the team versus someone who's tokenized? And I think these are, these are really, really important conversations that need a lot of additional, um, additional time. Um, so I think what we'll do is we'll, um, we'll uh, debrief and look at all the questions and try to come up with some initial responses, but also think about some additional conversations focusing in on, on you know, some of these specific topic areas. Um, it's a great group of people on the call today, and um, any last comments that you guys want to make? Oh, I really admire your special in general because I think it's a frontier job. I'm happy to be a supporter, but I really admire and even and even programs that take it on are willing to to uh, do it and, and I, I it's I want to be helpful. And at the RTC we do offer technical assistance and I could use some of my time to help. Great. Great, thank you. So, so Jonathan is available as a resource. Um, sounds like Sasha has some availability as well. Um, and there's a, clearly a, a great demand for this type of conversation. So we'll we'll definitely pick back up on it. Um, so thank you, everyone. We've hit the end of our time, unfortunately. Um, but this is a great resource that will be on the web, and everyone will get a. Um, a survey asking uh, for your feedback, so we, we definitely want to look at that. Um, and we'd love your ideas about additional topic areas related to this. So uh, 